Our special guest for this event uh, really is an extraordinary human guinea pig. <laughs> Barbara Arrowsmith-Young. Uh, I would say Barbara is fundamentally a self-experimenter. It's her own story, her own experience that led her to shape the lives of countless others and particularly to shape their brains, quite literally. As she says it, our brains shape us as we shape our brains. And she also says... Uh, by changing the brain, we can change how we learn, which kind of feels natural these days to say that, doesn't it? And fairly intuitive. But when Barbara started experimenting with her own brain, a brain that had caused her great distress for the first well, 25, 26 mm -hmm. years of her life, this idea that we can manipulate the physiology of our brains through exercising it, through thought, uh, really pushed against every orthodoxy about the brain in science and beyond. Barbara is an educational psychologist. She is the founder of the very famous Arrowsmith School, which first opened in Toronto around 1980. And uh, today it's a program that's uh, implemented in 35 schools in Canada and the US, and we've just been chatting. She uh, looks like she's uh, going to base a school here too in Australia. And it's really not overstating its impact to say it's radically changed the lives and brains of many, many, many hundreds uh, of people who were cast aside in different ways because in some way or another they were deemed to have brains that were deficient. And she tells their story and her own in this wonderful new book, The Woman Who Changed Her Brain and Other Inspiring Stories of Brain Transformation. Let's give her a warm welcome. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you for having me. You know, there are many beginnings uh, in your story, but let's start perhaps with the most important. Mm -hmm. You dedicate this book to the famous physiologist and psychologist, Russian, mm -hmm. Alexandria Luria, yes. uh, who only died in 1977. Why, why do you dedicate the book to him? Uh, he was really um, my lifeline. Uh, it was in 1977 that I came across a book called The Man with a Shattered World. And it was um, a, a journal that, that, uh, of, a, of a Russian soldier who had had a bullet wound in 1943 to a specific part of the brain and Luria worked with this man named Zazetsky and chronicled his story and when I read that it was like reading my life on the page I mean all of the things that um, Zazetsky struggled with after his brain wound were the things that I couldn't do like telling time understanding language um, just really processing meaning uh, I couldn't understand conversations and it was the first time that I realized that it was what was wrong with me. I mean, I knew from grade one that there was something very wrong, um, but nobody had had any kind of answer or explanation. And this was, this was my first realization that here was what the problem was. It was part of my brain that wasn't functioning. And to create a solution for something, one has to understand what it is that's wrong. So it, it gave me tremendous hope that if, if it was a part of my brain that wasn't working, maybe there was a possibility that I could do something to change that. Well, it more than gave you hope. It totally changed your life. <laughs> yes, it did. <laughs> Barbara, you came into the world an asymmetrical baby. Yes, yes. I... I um, um, have you know, one arm that you know never straightened, an eye that didn't really function properly. I couldn't you know, really function on this whole left side of my body. Um, I couldn't register where sensation was coming from. I could put my hand on a, a burner and I would know that there was pain, but if I wasn't looking at it, I wouldn't know where it was. Um, very uncoordinated and, and clumsy. And it was really the asymmetry that was in my body was the asymmetry that was in my brain. Mm. Um, so it was sort of written, you know, in my physiology, and um, it, it was, you know, really quite a struggle and quite painful growing up, um, just 
being different. I mean, I couldn't excel academically and I couldn't excel athletically. A lot of students with learning disabilities, if they're struggling academically, maybe they're good in, in terms of sports or athletics. I had neither avenue mm -hmm. um, open. I was really, you know, very much a klutz and clumsy. I had a spatial difficulty. I got lost all the time. I inherited that, I believe, from my mother. It was always um, interesting. We would get into the car and we would end up where we were supposed to be going, but we never quite knew how we got there. Um, it was, it was, <laughs> it was a common experience. <laughs> it was an adventure. Um, so, so yes, I mean, when I, I read Lurie's work, it, it was, um, it was an incredible revelation that, that maybe I could do something about this. Well, in a sense, you described the whole left side of you as foreign territory. It, it, it was. It felt like that, did it, on the inside? It, it, oh, it, very much so. And it would do things that, that um, they talk about alien hand syndrome, right? Um, I had alien left side syndrome. I mean, I, I remember once, um, you know, I was trying to close a drawer with my right hand and, you know, for some reason this drawer wouldn't close and I was feeling pain. I looked down and my left hand was in the drawer and I was closing the drawer uh, on, on that hand but not recognizing it. Or I would, you know, if I went to go and, you know, pick up this cup of water, I would end up, you know, pouring it mostly all over myself or at times I couldn't inhibit the motion so it, you know, would end up going over my shoulder. So this whole side of my body was, was really... Like you'd had a stroke. It was like I had a stroke. Um, and I mean, my mother, I remember saying that she didn't think I would live past age five because I was constantly falling, um, you know, cutting myself, ending up in, you know, doctor's offices, getting stitches. Um, it, it was just, it, it was like, um, it just did not function. So what were your parents told about you? In, in grade one, my teacher called my mother in and uh, told her that I had a mental block and that I wouldn't learn like other children um, would. And at that point, in grade one, being quite literal, I actually thought I had a piece of wood in my head, um, which I didn't, luckily, but I might as well have. I mean, I, I did have significant blockages in parts of, of my brain. Um, so in grade one, I read everything backwards, wrote everything backwards, if I went to add numbers, if it was 12 plus 31, I would add it as 21 plus 13, and then mm. I would reverse the answer. Mm. Um, and my teacher really thought I was doing this deliberately. I mean, I got the strap in grade one. Um, I mean, they didn't understand learning disabilities. I mean, there wasn't a concept of uh, learning disability. I think the term was coined in 1962, so this was in the 50s. And... Um, you know, I, I learned very early in grade one to do a lot of avoidant kinds of behaviors that I, I see children do. I spent a lot of time in the washroom, um, which the teacher didn't seem to mind. I guess if I was gone out of the classroom, uh, she didn't have to deal with me. And, um, and so the I, 1950s uh, education system had really made its mind up about you, it seems. Yes, I mean, and the belief was, you know, I, I couldn't learn. Um, my view of myself was that I was stupid um, and that, you know, I, I could look at all of my other classmates and they were able to learn things. I was labeled a turtle, um, which, you know, meant that I was, you know, moving pretty slowly uh, in terms of academics. Um, yeah, but you say slow, but you confused people too because at different times you were described as gifted, at other times you were described as slow. So you had talent. Yes, I, I definitely had strengths. Um, I mean, I had a phenomenal visual memory and a phenomenal auditory memory. Almost the, the visual was like photographic and the auditory was verbatim. Um, and I think I was probably born with, with those good memories in place. And then I used them to compensate for my deficits. So I think mm -hmm. I really unbeknownst to myself, created my own exercises very early to stimulate my brain and, and work those areas. So I would memorize everything. I didn't understand anything. Um, and depending on how well, if I was doing an exam, if I could understand the question or somewhat understand the question and then match it up to what I had memorized, um, at times I might get 
uh, 80%, but other times if I didn't do a good match, I would get 10%. And of course, the teachers would think that if I could get 80% once, I should be able to do that all the time. So if mm -hmm. I was getting 10%, it must mean I wasn't trying hard enough. And I was, I became a workaholic in grade one. I mean, I would come home at lunch because the school was right across the street and I would do schoolwork. I would come home after school and do schoolwork. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it took that amount of effort and energy just to tread water. Gee, you're tenacious. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because um, Barbara went to graduate school. Mm -hmm. It's hard to imagine that you made it there. Mm. How did you make it there? Uh, through working 20 hours a day and sleeping four hours a night. Um, I had a whole ritual in, in, uh, in university where I learned the routines of the, the guards in the library. And I would hide out as they were doing their, um, their checks at night. Like I would either hide out in the washroom, I'd hide out under my cubicle um, and, and continue to study long after the library was closed because it was quiet. Um, so I, I just, I, it was brute, brute force and effort using my memory and you know I, I did have um, incredible drive and determination and in my family it was just accepted that all of us were going to go to university it was sort of an unwritten rule so I felt I didn't have a choice um, that, that, that I had to do that but at tremendous cost I mean there were lots of times of despair um, you know one point, you know, attempting suicide, other points this seriously your, considering your it. Mid to late teens, wasn't yes, it? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. I just, you know, points felt like I just, I, I couldn't go on. Like there, there were, um, the, the, just the amount of effort it was, was taking and the, the social isolation. I mean, because I didn't understand, it was like when people would talk to me, it was almost like a foreign language. Um, if, if there was any complexity beyond, you know, that it's, it's sunny out today or, you know, the chair is red, which is very concrete, mm. um, I struggled with understanding it. So it was very socially isolating. And, um, so I, I didn't really have friends, um, it was not a very happy existence. It's a hard terrain to go to revisit, I imagine, in some ways, but you've moved so far beyond mm -hmm. it. I have to read uh, the psych psychoanalyst and psychiatrist Norman Doidge, who, of course, has written your story in his uh, very famous book, The Brain That Changes mm -hmm. Itself, um, and has drawn a lot of people to the school that you now yes. run in Toronto. But he describes you as bold, ingenious, uh, tormented, driven, and deeply empathetic mm -hmm. uh, uh, as a pioneer. The torment is interesting. Yes, it, it, I, I think it's, it's very accurate. I um, was tormented by the, the struggles and the challenges and the isolation. Um, and, and, you know, it, it still is there to some extent. I mean, I was 26 when I created the exercise. I used to have this naive belief that, you know, you address the cognitive piece and all the emotional aspects should just drop away, but, but they don't. I mean, it's, it's sort of almost bred in the bone in a sense of, of for all those years feeling um, like I was incompetent, that I was unintelligent. Um, it, it takes a long time to to um, get over those feelings. So let's come to when you were 26 and you read this paper by Alexandra Luria, the book by Alexandra mm -hmm. Luria, and you're blown out of the water. Mm -hmm. And you also read um, a key study about rats' brains. Yes. Tell us about that and why that also just went, oh, oh my God, yes. made you just reconsider the possibility for yourself. Yes, that was um, Mark Rosenschweig's work in Berkeley. And he was um, working with rats and the whole concept of neuroplasticity. So he put one group of rats in a very enriched environment, like a cage with lots of toys to play with. And then this other poor group of rats just in, I guess, a, a cage with not much to play with. And what he found was the rats that had all the stimulation learnt better on mazes, which is like a little rat IQ test. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, because there were rats, he could sacrifice them after the experiment, and he looked at their brains. And the rats that had been in the rich environment and, and had all the stimulation had um, more dendrites, so more branching on the neurons, which means more efficient um, communication. Uh, they had more neurotransmitters, more glia cells. So, so the brain had changed physiologically, which allowed that better learning. 
And then he did a really interesting experiment. He took a group of rats and he blindfolded them and he put them in a very tactile sensory environment. And when he looked at their brains afterwards, it was a part of the brain that responded to sensory, to tactile stimulation that had changed. And for me, then a light bulb went off. Like if, if you could find an activity to sort of differentially stimulate a specific part of the brain, you could change it. And I had to believe that humans had more neuroplasticity than rats did. See, this was heresy. It was heresy, yes. Why? Because people, first of all, at that time, this was in 1978, weren't looking at the brain at all in terms of learning disorders. I'm not quite sure where they thought they resided, but, but the brain wasn't part of the and conversation. In our little toe, yes, little toe yes. or something. Yeah. <laughs> or bad teaching. I, I don't know yeah. I don't know in what the they ether. thought. Yes. Yeah. Um, so first to say that that is a part of the brain that isn't working properly um, was heretical. And then to say you can actually go in and potentially change that part of the brain that through targeted stimulation or targeted exercise you can change the brain physiologically, which then allows that part of the brain to learn, to process information, to do whatever it's supposed to do, um, you know, efficiently, effectively. So it, it, um, it was pretty lonely at the beginning of, of doing this work. There well, this wasn't is when acceptance. You, this is when you decided you, you didn't become a rat, but you did become a, a human guinea pig, yes. quite literally, didn't you? And that flashbulb uh, set you on a path of self-experimentation. Yes. Tell us what you did. Well, I, I knew that I couldn't tell time. Um, I'd never been able to read an analog clock. Um, and when I'd read about Zazetsky, he had obviously been able to tell time before his wound, but as soon as he had been wounded in that part of the brain, he lost the ability to tell time. Mm. So I thought maybe that would be an activity. I mean, it, it was trying to find something that would work that part of the brain, and I, I didn't know whether it would work or not. Um, but if we think about telling time, it's really processing relationships. I mean, you have to think about the hour hand and the minute hand, and that if it's 1.45, the hours move three quarters of the way through, represented by the minutes. So it's, it's a relationship. And I thought, okay, I can't process relationships in general. Um, so you, so when you looked at the hands of a clock, you, they jumbled up? They jumbled up, I, yes. I, they didn't really have meaning for me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, I could count the little ticks, but it, 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 it didn't mean something, or the concept of time didn't mean anything to me. So I thought, if I can create an exercise with clocks, maybe I could do something in terms of, of working that part of the brain. And, and because I couldn't tell time, I had to have a friend help me with a watch and, and, and turn the, the hands of the watch to different times. And then I wrote them um, you know, on a piece of paper, like I, I drew the clock. Mm. And then I just got faster and faster at being able to look at those clocks and actually start to, to see the relationships. I mean, I probably worked six, seven hours a day um, because, again, I was... Obsessive. Obsessive, I mean, obsessive. It, it, yes, this, yeah. yes. Could yes. you imagine yeah. sitting there looking at the hands of a clock for six or seven hours a day for days at an end? Yes. You were driven, weren't you? I was very driven. I was desperate. I was desperate. I, just, I was at a point in graduate school where... Um, I was again thinking about suicide. I just, I didn't know what my future would be. I just um, didn't think I could go on. So mm -hmm. I, yes, I was very, I was driven and I was desperate. And I figured this might be a possible way out of, out of my problems. And as I got faster and faster at being able to process two hands, I thought, okay, I need to make it more complex. So I added a second hand. Um, and so now there was three relationships I was processing. By the time I got up to four relationships, I added a fraction of a second. Um, I started, my whole world opened up. I started to be able to hear conversations and understand them as I was listening Just to them. Just through, you feel, through the process of this clock exercise? Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, there was nothing else I was doing. And it, it was, it, it, I, could, I could take a book off the shelf and I could read a page and I could understand it as I was reading. And what I always felt before and, and experienced it was I, I lived in what I call lag time. I didn't live in real time because as I listened to things or read things in, you know, um, in the moment, I couldn't understand them. And I would play them over like my, my tape recorder. I would play it over and over and over again, at times for hours after the conversation or after I'd read something to 
try to come up with an understanding of what the meaning was. And now I could do it in real time. I could, I, as I was reading, I understood. I mean, it was like an epiphany. Um, I remember I couldn't listen to documentaries. I could listen to them, but I couldn't understand them. And there's the program 60 Minutes. And I had a friend that would always interpret and translate for me as, as I was watching those programs. And when I really knew that something had changed, is he was turning to translate, and I had already gotten the the you know what they were talking about. Mm. Um, and it, it was really exciting. I could look at, I could open books of mathematics and 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 start to figure out you know what they were talking about. And I'd never I'd memorized mathematics and mathematical formulas. I'd um, I'd never understood them. Barbara, what do you think? What what was your hypothesis at the time? Uh, I mean, you were using you were using Luria uh, mm -hmm. uh, as your inspiration, as your mm -hmm. guiding light, if you mm -hmm. like. What what did you think was going on in your brain? I, I thought that I was changing it at a physiological level. I thought I was doing what those rats, you know, had done with the stimulation. I, um, I thought that you know, what I was doing by the targeted exercise was actually going in and, and somehow, whether, you know, um, growing dendrites, like somehow at a physiological level, changing that part of the brain so it was able to process um, relationships. And, and after I saw that success, I thought, okay, I want to address, you know, the dysfunctional left side of my body. So I created an exercise, um, you know, for that, which was very different. It was a whole process of doing things with my eyes closed because for the sensory feedback, you have to know how far your muscles have moved. So what did um, you do? I, I um, created an exercise with like complex um, Chinese characters, figures, and I had to draw them as well with my eyes closed as I could with my eyes open using the left side of like my left hand. So it was sort of kinesthetic. It was kinesthetic, sort of absolutely. Because the only way you could do it was through the, the the sensory feedback of how far the muscles had moved. And it, at first, I was all over the place. I mean, it, it was a mess. And eventually, over time, I got to be as accurate with my eyes closed as I was with my eyes open. Mm -hmm. And and I've worked that exercise now with with many many people. And and the whole ability of whichever side of the body it is now can start to process sensory information. And then I had the spatial deficit. So I decided, okay, I've done the reasoning and I've done the Human kinesthetic. Human guinea pig. <laughs> yes. So I, I created an exercise, um, you know, for that and, mm. and uh, you know, and was able not to get lost. But it was more than just getting lost. It's the whole ability to think into three-dimensional space, which I couldn't do. For me, if something went into a drawer, it no longer existed. I could not visualize my way into three-dimensional space. If... Um, you know, in Canada we have IKEA. I don't know if you have that oh, here, yes, but it's global. yes, yes, <laughs> where you know some assembly required. There isn't a crevice in the universe yes. that doesn't have IKEA. So, so you look at those <laughs> those flat diagrams, and you have to like be able to construct them inside your head to to build something. I always knew that. I would get the back on backwards. I'd get the shelf in upside down um, because I couldn't the translate the diagram. The entire has a learning disability in <laughs> related to, to IKEA. IKEA. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, but after working on that area, I, I could do those 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 kinds of things. Or I wanted to study organic chemistry, and if you think about that, there are all the molecules that you have to build and construct spatially, and I hadn't been able to do that. Or geometry, um, you know, which is, is very spatial. Um, and, and so all of that shifted, and that's what l really led me to believe I must be changing something fundamental, because it, it isn't just that I got better at the exercise, all of the symptoms related to that cognitive function shifted. So... Not really that many years later, mm -hmm. you decide to set up the Arrowsmith School mm -hmm. in your name mm -hmm. in Canada. Mm -hmm. What was the vision for the Arrowsmith School? Because here was an idea that pushed against, well, not just scientific orthodoxy, um, but also educational orthodoxy around learning disabilities, didn't it? And still does yes. to a great degree. Yes, I mean, traditional, um, you know, programs in special education are really the premises the learner is fixed, that, that there's strengths and weaknesses that the learner has and that we have to adjust or modify the curriculum to match the, the 
the learning strengths and learning weaknesses of the learner, what um, I feel and argue is that we can actually change the capacity of the learner, so then the learner can learn all aspects of, of um, curriculum. So, I mean, I set up the school because I wanted to help other people. It's that, a private that, school. A private school that, that struggled like I did. Um, I just, I felt like, you know, I, I have a solution here for some very specific problems, not everything that's related to learning. And I wanted other people to be able to access that and and, um, and benefit from it. And there was a lot of resistance at, at that was time. It? Yes, because that was what ni sort of 1980. Um, I, I thought people would want to come in, like psychologists, various people, and see what I was doing, and nobody was really interested in, mm. in coming in. Um, you were a maverick in some respects, weren't you? Yes, mm. yes. So I, I decided I had two options. One would be to spend a lot of energy trying to shift the climate and, and convince people of the possibility of this work, or I could spend my energy actually developing more programs and, and more cognitive exercises and working with more students, and that's the direction mm -hmm. I decided to go in. And, and, and over time, the climate has shifted. I mean, we now understand about neuroplasticity, that, that our brains aren't fixed, um, and that, that this kind of work is possible. Mm, gee, the climate has changed so much. I mean, neuroplasticity is the buzzword, isn't it now? Yes. And uh, I have to say, though, with that, you know, I guess I've been tracking those conversations over the last decade, and 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 you just get this sense that there are a lot of, um, well, there are a lot of people kind of marketing uh, their own tools. Mm -hmm big time, mm -hmm. neuroplasticity tools, and they're marketing themselves as gurus. Mm. And uh, that's a risk, isn't it? It, it definitely is. I mean, um, especially working with people with learning disabilities, it, it, it's, it's, you know, there's a lot of desperation there, as, as I know myself. And really the programs need to come out of good science, like r really good science. Um, and some of them do and some of them don't and it's hard sometimes to discern which is which. But you say that and yet you were pushing against science. I mean, there wasn't really science to... You were kind of creating the science yourself in some respects. In, in some respects, yes, but this, the science was there. It was buried in the labs. Like, I mean, Rosenzweig's work was was there. Um, I mean, obviously with animals, and and Luria's work was there in terms of identifying the function of, of different brain areas. So it, it was there, but it, it just wasn't commonly known. Who walks through the doors of Arrowsmith today? And uh, I've been mean, reading some of the stories, and there are lots and lots of stories. Mm. Um, because this is, uh, what, over 30 years now yes. worth of people's stories and transformations. Um, you get this real sense that uh, they, they come to the school, they open, walk in those doors with a lot of grief and pain mm -hmm. and, you know, a kind of lifetime of ostracism that they've been told they're stupid. Um, or they've been diagnosed with ADHD, for example. Mm -hmm. That's very common too, isn't it? Yes, it is. And I have a lot of students that when they first come to me are on medication um, for uh, attentional problems. And in probably about 80% of the cases, by the end of the program, they're off the medication because it, in my view, isn't true ADHD. It's, it can be for a number of reasons. One, what I call cognitive load. They have a number of cognitive areas that are, are causing them difficulty. So every time they walk into that classroom, they're being asked to do things that take tremendous effort, just like what I was asked to do. And it's, it, they get exhausted. And as soon as they get exhausted and they, they can't pay attention, their attention wanders, they start to... Um, engage in activities that probably their teacher would prefer that they, they don't engage in to, to avoid what's difficult for them. So they get labeled as having attentional problems and, mm. and get medicated. And then they're, they're the prefrontal cortex, like the executive function, both in the right and left hemisphere, which part of the function of those areas is sort of active, sustained engagement. And so if there's, if there's a cognitive deficit in either of those areas, very much you see the distractibility that, that they can't sustain attention to completion of a task. They get pulled off by irrelevancies. And I have programs for those two areas. And as those come online, um, again, the attentional piece is addressed so they don't need the medication. And then there are some students that truly are going to need medication, but it's a much smaller percentage 
then then you know what uh, I think gets identified and you're medicated. working with both adults and children yes and uh, I mean a lot of people come to you and they've spent a kind of lifetime being told that they're just behaving badly mm -hmm. that they're disobedient yes uh, recalcitrant don't they yes and there are some particular deficits that seem to generate that expectation mm -hmm. of people, don't they? That they've just been behaving naughty. They're naughty. Yes. Well, I mean, the, the problem that I had, the reasoning problem, if you don't really understand what's going on around you, um, you know, and, and misunderstand, you know, what people are saying, uh, it, it can lead to um, behavioral problems or, again, the, the prefrontal cortex, that part of the brain, which allows like judgment. Um, there's one of the chapters is called uh, leap before you look. Um, and that's, you know, the, the social problems, the social judgment where uh, the person can't read the social cues and so misinterprets what's going on. Um, I remember one, one student who had a lot of difficulty there and one day I got a call from her mother and her mother said that the teacher was sleeping in class and so her daughter couldn't get her work marked. And I mean, the mother knew her daughter and thought probably this was a misinterpretation but needed to check it out. And, and what had happened is... She thought the teacher was sleeping. The, the, the girl thought the teacher was sleeping. And, and uh, so what, when I investigated, you know, the teacher, it was the end of the day, her po body posture was very slouched in the chair. So it could look like she was sleeping. But if the girl had looked further, she would have seen that the teacher's mouth was moving. She was far enough away that she couldn't hear the language and that the teacher's eyes were open. So clearly she wasn't asleep. And it's what I call this premature closure. It's where a person with this problem looks at a few features of the situation and then makes an interpretation that isn't correct because it hasn't taken in all of the information and then runs with that interpretation. And this little girl, I think she was 11 at the time, um, none of the children in her neighborhood wanted to play with her because she was constantly misinterpreting and had a reputation as a teller of tall tales, which wasn't This was Vanessa. Truth. Yes. She was a fibber. Yes, yes, yes. And, and in her world, it wasn't that she was fibbing, that was how she was interpreting it. Mm. Um, really and, hard to unpick that, isn't it? Yes. I mean, when people come to you, so you've identified um, 19 cognitive deficits mm -hmm. that you can work with. Actually, I thought it might be um, worthwhile me just uh, reading the little subheadings of some of those, because okay. I think we'll all relate to them. Um, it's officially called motor symbol sequencing, but it, the little subheading is, please don't erase that blackboard yet. Mm. Think of that kid in the classroom. Mm. Another one of them is symbol relations, but the mm. little subheading is, I just don't get it. Mm. Or, I have a memory like a sieve. Or, another one is, my words don't always come out in the right order. I mean, we can all relate, and many of you mm -hmm. will relate to different ones of these. Or, people say, I mumble. Mm -hmm. Or, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? All sort of emblematic, aren't they, yes. of different cognitive deficits that you've decided that you can work with? Yes, yes. And, and I work with people, I mean, from age five, I've worked with people up to age 74. Um, and some of these really, um, as an adult, impact the people in terms of the career choices. I mean, that one about memory like a sieve, uh, I had an adult that came to me who was a pilot and he had a lot of trouble with auditory memory, so he had to have the air traffic controller repeat the instructions over and over again. So he, he yes, exactly. That's hairy. I, yes, <laughs> I, I used to want to know what his flight plan was, so I would avoid <laughs> flying. I'm but, all into but, inclusive workplace practices. Yes, but <laughs> <laughs> yes, but he, he did address that area, and mm -hmm. and um, you know, no longer had that 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 challenge. But also with the book, um, we did a lot of interviews and tape them and we had a transcription service transcribe them and I got used to, you know, as I was reading the transcripts, there was one transcriber that had the auditory speech discrimination problem and I had such compassion for her because all day she was transcribing things that she was hearing, she couldn't read lips and she was mishearing things. So one of my brothers, you know, was talking about my mother and making a joke and saying she wasn't cold and awful and evil and the transcriber transcribed this as my mother wasn't yet off the needle. So, I mean, my mother was a heroin addict and I didn't know it. Um, so it, it, it's, it's yeah. sort of humorous, but, and, and the Catskill Mountains became the Catgill, Catgill's Mountains. Um, and 
and imagine like this woman, this was how she was earning her living, but the, the struggle it must have been for her to have to listen to this and try to transcribe it, the mistake she would make. And I could, I could interpret it and know what it should be, but I think if she was a court reporter, I mean, she wouldn't keep her job because there the accuracy is really important. Like I'm just, I'm so humbled by kind of the people that walk through the door and the struggles that, that they um, have. There was also story I like to tell about um, um, someone that was doing their residency as a pathologist in, in uh, New Haven in Connecticut and he was examining breast tissue um, it was somebody that had had cancer and you know they wanted to see was she in remission after treatment mm. and it's a part of the brain in the right hemisphere that, that holds the visual image of things so I mean if you're good here you can hold the visual image of what healthy cells look like and what health cells that aren't healthy look like and he he had a difficulty there and he misdiagnosed he thought that that the person was was cancer free, and luckily he was under supervision. So his supervisor saw. I said, "Did you know you missed this?" Um, so I've, he left his residency program and worked on that cognitive area, and he won't make that kind of mistake again because now that capacity is in place. But I think about things that we think about as human error. They're really cognitive incompatibilities with the demand of the task. So it's yeah. where somebody is, is, is trying to do something um, that they don't have the, the cognitive resources to do. And it's really not human error. I had somebody on the Olympic ski jump team who had the kinesthetic problem, just like I did, but much at a much milder level. But when you come down those chutes, at, like I don't know whether it's 100 kilometers an hour, yeah. um, you can't afford to have a slight misperception of where your body is. So he would fall um, to that side. I had someone with that deficit who got a motorcycle and within one month had five accidents. Because again, you're controlling that machine so with you your work body. With him? So if someone it, like that came to you... It was that exercise with the eyes closed. It's a, the same one that I created for myself. And, and by the end of it, you know, didn't have that problem. Mm. But I think there are all all of these, you know, people out there struggling with these these things that that can be rectified and addressed. Subtle and extreme. Mm -hmm. There have been some very extreme transformations, haven't there? Yes. Um, I mean, some some children have come in to the school, so they sort of step outside of the mainstream schooling mm -hmm. and come to Arrowsmith, and they've barely had any speech. Yes. Yes. How extreme? Um, well, exactly like that. The, the, there's a little boy in the book that talks about once he got language, he, he described it, he said it was like a big pot of soup and there were the, all these words floating around, but he could never put them together. Like it, it, um, and, and what's profound about that disorder is not just that he can't, couldn't put the speech, the words together externally, he couldn't think inside his head. And one of the ways we regulate our behavior and control our behaviors by talking to ourselves inside our head. And he, he couldn't do that. And I had two individuals with that problem um, that ended up being sentenced to me by the courts um, because, they, I mean, if you think about it, we run scenarios through our head. If I do this, then that will happen. And maybe that's yeah. not a good idea. And they couldn't do that. So they, they couldn't, you know, look at you know, various um, scenarios and we worked on those areas and addressed them and you know, they're, they're successful and, and don't have any difficulty. This is a, a, a story um, full of positive stories, mm -hmm. but does the approach work for everyone? It, Are there people that you know you can't work with or despite all efforts and hope mm -hmm. and potential, uh, some of the series of, well, often quite esoteric exercises mm -hmm. where people are kind of doing things rote mm -hmm. over and over again, listening to Hebrew over and over again, all mm -hmm. sorts of little uh, tests that you've created for different cognitive deficits. Mm -hmm. Do some people just not go through a transformation? What I find, there, there's some individuals that no matter how much we try, they've, they've just given up. Um, and we're very good at, at motivating students. And also the exercises are very motivating because there's mastery built in. So the student does something and they, they find they can actually master something, whereas a lot of these children have learned that effort doesn't lead to reward. Um, are they rewarding? Some of the exercises sound really tedious to me. They, I mean, they're, they're tedious, but 
But we all have mastery motivation, and, and the, the goal is that you start, you know, if the cognitive functioning is holding at a certain level, you don't want to start the exercise way below because it won't stimulate and there'll be no engagement. You can't start it too high because there won't be engagement, it'll be too frustrating. So you, you want to start it just slightly above where that cognitive functioning is, is holding at. And what the student does learn very quickly, even though some of them are, are not too exciting, is that if they put that effort into it, they all of a sudden master it and they move on to a harder level of difficulty. And, and about the three to four month mark, they start to see significant cognitive change that, that translates into their life, that they, they can, if it's the auditory memory, I've had students that come in and they've won a radio contest because they could remember the phone number, they could remember the instructions, they could do the skill testing question. And that's when it's really motivating, when, when there's that... Um, Life's a transformed. That life... Have you in all this, so you started out kind of operating outside of the bounds of mainstream science, mm -hmm. have uh, any neuroscientists kind of stolen some of your students and put them in brain scans and, uh, and tested them neurologically to validate uh, some of your hypotheses around what, what you're doing? I, Are there changes physically observable in the brain? That I haven't had the opportunity to do and one of the things I... I'm hoping maybe through this book is some neuroscientists might get interested in, in doing that. I mean, the, the challenge with the, using the, the brain scan technologies is it's very, very expensive to do, um, and I don't have the, the resources to do that, and I would be very interested in, in doing that. And I'm I really believe, surprised that a bevy of neuroscientists haven't sort of pounced on you, actually, because it's the, you know, the great decade, century mm -hmm. of the brain, really. Well, I, I'm hoping now that more people are aware of this work that that, that may happen. Mm. We're going to come to you for questions in, in, in just a tick. Um, uh, ha have there been any transformation? Well, actually, one thing that I found very interesting is that people, when they start addressing these um, uh, cognitive deficits, they kind of discover aspects of themselves that they never knew about, like a sense of humour mm -hmm. or an emotional core. I mean you know, that they didn't know about. Yes, yes. I mean, and, and I mean, certainly from my own experience, um, because of the, the reasoning problem, I mean, I, irony didn't mean anything to me. I mean, I, I definitely developed a, a sense of humor because I could understand, I mean, there's a surface meaning and, and with irony and humor, there's, there's sort of the, the underlying meaning or a variety of different meanings. Um, so definitely with that cognitive exercise you see with the students, they, they develop a beautiful sense of humor. Um, and also in terms of the emotions, I mean, if we think about, again, that, that reasoning problem, if one can't, you know, connect ideas or even cause an effect, um, you don't understand, like, why something happened. I mean, that's how Norman Deutsch initially got interested in my work. Uh, we're both in, in Toronto, and he was seeing people in his practice that he felt... As a psychiatrist. As a psychiatrist, psychiatrist. Mm. yes, that, that were coming to him that was really a cognitive deficit, not an emotional deficit, but was playing out emotionally. And so he started referring some of those clients, and we, we watched the transformation that they could start to have insight. Um, they could start to make connections mm. like this happened again because of this or you know all of that 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 cause and effect I mean before their world was very fragmented just like mine was and and disconnected and they've been and told they had emotional problems yes rather yes, than actual yes. physiological yes problems yes and and in some cases well, emotions are physiological what am I saying yes, but you yes. know what I mean but <laughs> and, in, in, and in some cases you know they were working with other therapists that were telling them that they were being resistant um, because they weren't progressing and weren't benefiting from the therapy they weren't being resistant they they cognitively couldn't benefit from the therapy and after the cognitive peace was in place, they could. Mm. Um, you're going to bring, you really want to bring this program to Australia. Yes. Yes. Are, you, are you making head road? Yes, I'm, I'm in conversations with um, some different organisations and, and my real goal is within a year to have the program here. And have, has mainstream learning disability circles and education circles uh, come to embrace you? Um, I would say 
it's it's still mixed, but yes, I mean my my program is in uh, Saskatchewan, one of the provinces in on, in Canada, and it's in the Learning Disabilities Association, um, which you know a number of years ago didn't believe in neuroplasticity and and this kind of work. So there's more and more recognition of the possibility, and what I find is is once a school system takes on the program, and the teachers start to see the kinds of transformations in their students. Um, they embrace this this program because so all some these teachers, state schools are sort of taking it and yes. inserting into their into, in, their, into curriculum. Their, their curriculum. Yes, oh, interesting. Yeah. Hey, let's come to you for questions. Um, uh, we've got two roving mics with the chaps in t-shirts, and uh, pop your hand up, and we'll come to you. You might like to identify yourself, or you may not. And if you could keep them as questions, because I suspect there will be quite a few questions, so try and keep them fairly focused if you can. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, hi, Barbara. Thanks for uh, coming out. My name's Gavin. Barbara, I was curious, is the real trick of this repetition, or is it doing the right exercise? And Like your story with the clock, was the stroke of luck there that you did it with the, the clock, or was it just the hard work and the repetition? No, I, I believe it has to be the right stimulation. Um, and, and each of the cognitive areas that we work on have different, different programs. And what we see is that the change is very specific to the, the nature of, of that cognitive area and the nature of, of the program. So it has to be the correct um, stimulation, and then there has to be... There has to be Repetition, um, consistency, accuracy, and what I call automaticity. Like they, they, you have to be able to do the activity, um, you know, and process the information quickly. We'll just get the mic back to you if we can. Yep. So that implies a real piece of diagnosis at the start, rather than just some random exercises. Yes, and, and every child that comes through the program or every individual um, goes through an assessment where we look at the 19 different cognitive areas and we say this, this one's functioning well, this one's a mild problem, this one's a moderate, this is severe, and based on the profile, every individual's on a, a tailor-made program. You're taking people out of the mainstream school system. Yes. There are risks here, aren't there? Um, not, I mean... Not really, because what we find is in my school there, there are eight periods in the day, and six of them they're doing cognitive period or cognitive activities. They do one period of math and one period of English, and they might be with me from two to four years. But when they go back into the mainstream school, the cognitive pieces are in place. They haven't taken history, they haven't taken geography, but they can pick up those subjects because they can reason, they can remember, they can think, they can problem solve, um, they can retain the information. And these are children that have been in regular school and haven't benefited, have been tutored and haven't benefited. It's really, I mean, it's our brain that kind of mediates our understanding and our interaction with the world, and if we shift that, they can pick up all of what they need to pick up. Let's come to another question. Thank you. Uh, my name's Sean. I was just uh, curious about um, something uh, general like... Um, <clears throat> Depression and anxiety, is mm -hmm. that something uh, that these sort of programs uh, could help out in or is it, does it have to be a, a specific um, uh, deficiency that you're addressing? It's a good question. Mm. Um, I mean, what I find with a lot of the individual I work with because of the cognitive challenges that they have, they have anxiety, uh, a number of them have depression, and that gets alleviated as they work through the cognitive exercises. But if, if the, you know, the depression or the anxiety isn't related to one of the cognitive areas that, that I can work on, then probably my program wouldn't benefit the individual. It's a question of which came first sometimes, yes. isn't it? The chicken or the yes. egg with that one. Yes. Um, and another question? Yes, where are we next? Just up the back? Okay. Hello. Uh, you said at the start that, um, that you developed this extraordinary memory as a way of helping you cope with the visual and auditory memory. Mm -hmm. Have you found that now you've got other exercises to help you cope with your problems, that that's faded a little bit, that it's not as necessary? Um, so it's a good question. I'd say probably aging has made it fade a little bit, um, you know. And and I've actually started to 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 do you know some of the exercises to to work that because this this can work with just normal cognitive decline as a result of aging. Um, but I don't. That's a good question. I mean, sometimes people think that that if we're 
building a strength somewhere else, we're going to rob from another strength. And I don't find that happens um, because once the new strength is in place, um, it's not taking energy from the other piece. Like it's like they can all now work together and and function together. So so no, I, I other than aging, I didn't see a, a decline. Another question. I will probably just ask you at some point what exercises you are doing to uh, <laughs> ameliorate the age-related cognitive decline. Thanks. Uh, hello, yes. Uh, my name's Lloyd. Um, I was wondering about the upper limits of what the exercises can achieve. I mean, if, you've, mm-hmm. if you can read a, uh, say a, a, a clock or a watch perfectly well with the three hands um, and you decide to engage in trying to... Um, you know, read with four hands, five hands, six hands, etc., mm-hmm. which I understand some of your exercises stretch to. Um, does that, is that likely to Im- improve your ability in that area, um, despite the fact that you're kind of, I guess, within the what would be termed the normal range um, for that ability? Um, if you take someone who's exceptionally bright across all areas and um, give them the, you know, some of these various activities, mm-hmm. do they improve even further? Uh, just general question. Yes, I mean, um, I now have 10 handed clocks, and um, <laughs> very few people get up to that level. And in fact, two people that, that parents that came through the door, uh, one who discovered radio emitting galaxies, quasars. I was just going to say, and, it's like you get entering the 10th dimension. E- exactly. There. Yeah. And, and one who was a physicist from Harvard, they both looked at that and said, oh, wow, this is really exciting, right? They could actually see those relationships. So, you know, the average person could benefit from that, that level of exercise. I mean, what I ideally like to do, if somebody's had a deficit, is if possible, not just bring it to average, but try to bring it to a Above average, so now they have a strength um, to kind of make up for all that time that they had a deficit in that that area. I've also had people that have come to me with just average functioning in an area. Um, someone that wanted to be an architect, and he was at the 50th percentile in mechanical reasoning, which is not deficient, but to be an architect, it is deficient. Um, so I created a program for him, which I've now used with other individuals and got him up to the 98th percentile. And he's been an architect now for 15 years. So it, it has wide application from the individual that's really significantly struggling um, to people that are average. Um, and across the lifespan, I've worked with people up to age 74. Mm. Where are we next? Lots of hands. Hi, um, Barbara. I'd like to know more about age-related cognitive decli- decline. There seems to be a big opportunity there. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, well, almost any of the exercises can benefit, right? Because they're they're it's, it's you know stimulating that area. But the the one um, there's a, an auditory memory one that I have, which is is actually having the person have to memorize a lot of poetry and that seems to make a significant difference in terms of being able just to hold hold information um, and also the one the clocks one which is the second most important brain area that we have um, it, it makes processing faster and and so I think that you know have you this, measured that which, in yourself the, yes the yes, shift yes 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 mm-hmm. I've started I've started redoing the uh, that that exercise, yes. Okay. Yeah. Any others? Um, those are those are the, really the main two that that I'm finding. I mean, and and anyone could benefit, but but those two seem to make a significant difference. It's quite difference. pleasurable getting to remember scads of poetry. Yes. Any yes. favourite verse? Um, not that comes to mind. No. Aha. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> Let's have another question. Mm. Hi, my name's Paulina. Um, I just wanted to know whether um, there's a difference in terms of the success with the subjects, the source of the um, cognitive dysfunction. So, for example, if somebody has a a genetic Mm. um, diagnosis, for example, that might leave them predisposed to cognitive dysfunction, whether it matters, and whether you even engage in asking the reason or you just get on with the work. That's a good question. Um, in, I mean, if it's, if it's a neurodegenerative condition, um, like something like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, 
my work has probably limited benefit because it, it's it's trying to go in and stimulate something that that that's already you know significantly declining because of a disease process. Um, in terms of the individual I work with with learning disabilities, um, mostly it, it doesn't seem to matter what what the reason, and a lot of times we don't understand exactly what the reason is the, of the disorder, um, because it seems to be a static condition um, of, of a deficiency or a deficit, and, and we're going in and enhancing um, the function. So, so other than if it's, if it's neurodegenerative or things like, um, you know, autism, my, my work doesn't really benefit um, uh, people on the autistic spectrum. Is that spectrum. so? So no, what yes. about Asperger's? Asperger's, yes. I've, I've worked with a number of students with Asperger's, which is the high-functioning autism, and the program that I have for the nonverbal reading and interpretation is, has had a lot of success. I mean, they still have Asperger features, but they now have the ability to to read non-verbally and, and sometimes they so have other cognitive deficits. what do you mean by deficits. that, to read non-verbally, to sit there and, and read a novel on their own quietly? Uh, no, no, to read read the social situations. To, you know how, sorry, beg sorry, your pardon, yes, read something. Yes, so it's, it's like, <laughs> say we go into, into a, a party. Yeah. I mean, if you're good here, you start sort of surveying what's going on, who's interacting with who, what the, the voice tone, the facial um, features. How do you and get them to do that? What, what, what are the exercises well, that you do to help we people? We use lots of pictures. So they have to look at pictures. They look at pictures that tell a story. Um, and they have to interpret it. And, I mean, for the first while, they might be, their interpretations are wildly off. They they miss the cues, like the you know um, misinterpret. But again, over time, through repetition, starting with simple pictures and moving to more complex, they they become able to. It's, it's really stimulating that part of the brain. It's not that we want to get them better at reading pictures, mm. um, but that whole part of the brain that that reads nonverbal cues shifts, and then they can go out into the social world and and start reading those cues mm. in real interactions. It's, ne it's never really a part of a brain, is it? It's kind of a network it's of a connected network. parts yes, more. Yes. I mean, I, I, this is why I, I really would love a neuroscientist to yes, sit down with yes. some of your techniques. It'd be so interesting. Mm. Let's get some more questions in if we can. Applications. Sorry, do you want to take that again? Yep. Yep. Do you have any applications for your technique in uh, rehabilitative uh, use rather than developmental, like for uh, patients with acquired brain injury? I have worked with, um, um, again, not a huge number, but maybe 15, 20 individuals that have either stroke, aneurysm, car accident, and we've had success. I mean, the, the concern there is there still has to be some healthy tissue left in, in the area because if, if the tissue's gone, I, I can't shift it or enhance function. Um, but we, we've made, with those cases where there still is functioning, we've definitely um, seen significant improvement. Now, it tends to be... Um, you know, we can't do as much as we can with somebody with a learning disability because, again, there's there's been obviously trauma. But um, I mean, one of the students that I worked with, I don't think he's in the book. Um, he was uh, 12 when he was hit by a car, and I saw him when he was 30. So whatever spontaneous remission was going to happen had happened by then. And the first day he came into my school, he tried to walk out a filing cabinet because it looked like a door to him. So it was like Oliver Sacks, that, the man that mistook his wife for a hat. Um, he couldn't dress himself because, you know, his shirt has a tubular element, pants have tubular elements. They look, look the same to him. Um, and as I created exercises and worked with him. I mean, what was so amazing, he developed this beautiful sense of humor based on being able to see things in the visual world. Um, he also had physical damage as a result of the accident, so he would go out with people and walk in his neighborhood. And I remember one of the people that would walk with him called me up and said, this man, he remembered that at the, the house with, you know, the yellow house with the red maple um, was where he had to turn right. I mean, before he didn't even recognize there was a house there, that there was a maple tree, what the color of anything was. Um, and that, that was a result of stimulating that Incredibly that area. encouraging, isn't it, that you work with? Because often people, by the time they've got to 30, they've kind of been abandoned. Any mm -hmm. hope has been abandoned yes. of, of changing themselves. And yet you're working with, as you said, adults up into their 70s mm -hmm. yes. and having an impact, yes. which is just a wonderful challenge mm -hmm. to the assumptions that we've always had about, mm -hmm. uh, well, the brain that changes itself, yes. you know, as yes. we age. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, where are we next? 
We've got a few more minutes. So you've mentioned a couple of times about making um, exercises. How do you start that? Well, how do you know what's going to work? Where'd, how do you start that process? Uh, it was reading a lot of Luria. I mean, going in and, and reading his description of what the you know the different cognitive areas or the different brain areas do, um, and then trying to sort of intuit what would be an activity if that's the function of the area. What would be an activity to to work it? And and in the early days, there were times where some of the exercises ended up in the garbage pail. Um, you know that that I I tried them and they had limited success. And so then I would go back to the drawing board and and you know, try to figure another way in. And I think there are probably multiple ways to go in to, you know, stimulate the different brain areas. I've just come up with, with certain, you know, techniques at this point that, that work for the, the range that, that I can work with. Well, one of, the, one of them is, um, for example, you get kids to, or people to work with an eye patch. Yes. So what was the rationale there? Um, it's, it's the eye motor functioning that I'm trying to stimulate. So it, if the, the child um, with a reading disorder can't track words on a page, this is a child that has to use their finger or a ruler um, because the, the, the eye develops sort of well-ordered um, motor movements to track across print. And the eye motor movements are contralateral. So um, we use the patch on the left eye, the right eye motor movements talk to the premotor region in the left hemisphere. So I'm trying to get more stimulation into that area. By blocking off yes. a distracting eye. Yes. Making that eye work. Making that eye making work. Making that connection yes. more yes. potent. Yes. Hmm. It's endlessly interesting, isn't it? Um, let's have a couple more. Um, I think we've got a couple more minutes. Maybe what we might do is we'll just, we'll flit across a few different questions um, to grab a couple if that's okay. So, where are we now? There? Um, I've got three questions. So, the first one, do you anticipate you could find further cognitive skills that you could develop? Yes. Further than the 19 yes. you've identified? Yes, I've got some ideas. Yes. So, yeah. The second one is, could you anticipate that these skills could be developed before the malady shows itself? namely that you could be working with children in play to develop certain activities mm -hmm. that then result in um, guaranteeing more securely the development of these cognitive skills. Yes, I, I believe that's possible. A preventative strategy. Yes, yes, and I believe, I mean, there's research even before that with, um, uh, I mean, again, Rosenschweig's work with rats that... that pregnant rats. If you stimulated the pregnant rat, the rat in utero um, actually benefited from that stimulation. And I did have one student um, of mine that, that was expecting and her um, child in utero was diagnosed with mosaic turner syndrome and so i was really excited that that it, it's, it's a genetic disorder that affects spatial um, um a, a reasoning mostly in girls and so we we had decided that i was going to work with her on the cognitive exercises you know while she was pregnant but her pregnancy was too difficult so we we couldn't do that but i mean there's a possibility even possibly doing it um before the the child is born um, I might, if we can head to a, another person, because there, there's an awful lot of hands and we're actually officially meant to finish, but we might be allowed to have, can we have three more minutes? Oh, thank you. Hi, hi Barbara. Hi. My name's Manuela. Um, my understanding from reading about your program is that when students leave the program, their cognitive improvements are permanent. Yes. And I just wanted to confirm that. Do you find that they need to do ongoing exercises to maintain that? Or? No, no. And what I believe happens, I mean, we, we I use the analogy that the brain is like a muscle, but it really isn't. And I think what what happens is that once the area's been stimulated and it's working, it starts to get its own stimulation by being worked within the neural network, whereas before it's been a drag on that neural network, right? It's been pulling the, the functioning down. And that's what I hypothesize is going on practically. I've tracked people 30 years out of the program and there's no drop off in function. Hi, Barbara, my name's Dee and we had a uh, Lucrea moment with your book. So first of all, um, our son is 13 years old and uh, has pretty much, we ticked off every mm. single symptom. 
Um, Dylan is at a special school at the moment, but has been analysed as capable to go into mainstream. Um, and we have him in an intensive auditory processing program at the moment, which has um, exactly as Lucrea and yourself have explained, he said to us that he was in a dark dark tunnel mm. and now everything's nice and bright and shiny. Mm. So we're in first stage of, of um, intensely looking into opportunities for Dylan. So first of all, thank you very much for your amazing book. It's brought such hope to Dylan's long-term opportunities mm. for life. We have two qu very quick questions. First of all, um, please can we enrol Dylan? <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't my question. Um, Dylan was born with... Um, with trauma, mm -hmm. uh, he was a premature birth, and our question to you is, is there a high percentage of the children enrolled uh, at your wonderful school um, that have been brought into the world quite prematurely with uh, brain trauma Yes, yes. already? And is there a possibility that during development stage going from um, 18 months through to about three years where the peri periventricular part of the brain is, is developing from lying to standing, was there any seizures that you can remember from any of your... From my... Either uh, your, own, uh, your um, own... I mean, I've, I've definitely worked with students that had seizure disorders. Um, it, it, the work doesn't address the seizure disorder, but it can address the, you know, the, the cognitive challenges that have resulted um, you know, from that, yes, yes, if, if they're learning disorders. You have to be quite careful here because you don't want to invest many of the people that might come through with false hope. Yes, yes, no, I, I, I'm always very cautious, right, if I don't think that I, if my work can benefit, um, I want to be very clear on that. Can we thank Barbara Arrow smith young <laughs> Thank you.